Hi, I'm Amanda. I am a lymphedema therapist here in the Hawke's Bay and welcome to the Lymph Info Show. Uh, we are running the show on behalf of a charitable trust that we've set up called the Lymph Info Trust and that was set up because we realised there was a massive shortage in information for people with lymphedema and related conditions. Um, so we were really concerned that people weren't getting the information that they needed and that they were falling through the cracks, that there wasn't enough information out there, whether with uh, doctors understanding what was going on or nurses or the patients themselves. So we formed during the first lockdown in 2020 um, and we really want to be there for patients and healthcare professionals. So we're trying to get the message out there a little bit more about what these lymphatic conditions are. Uh, so I'm a massage and lymphedema therapist. I've been a massage therapist since about 2010, um, but I qualified in lymphedema management uh, in Austria in 2015, which was a lovely little trip. Um, and now I've been working with people since then, and uh, it just is a learning curve constantly. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit first about what the big deal about all this is. What is the lymphatic system? So the primary function of the lymphatic system is to move lymph. And the reason we need to do that is because the lymph system looks after your tissue waste. It's part of your immune system and it also manages your fluid levels. Now that lymph is it's a clear fluid. So you know when you ever get um, a little cut or a nick and it, it, it weeps but it doesn't weep blood but it, it weeps that clear fluid. That's lymph. And that's got a lot of white blood cells in it, so they fight infection. Um, it's also quite rich in protein, and that will become more important when we talk more about what happens when the lymphatic system doesn't work. Um, so we call it the secondary circulatory system. The lymphatic system is the secondary circulatory system. It lies next to the veins and arteries. Um, they have individual vessels just like capillaries, veins, arteries, but they also have um, lymph nodes which a lot of people talk about. People talk about their glands getting swollen. Um, they're not glands, they're actually nodes, it's a bugbear of mine. Um, but those lymphatic, uh, those lymph nodes work as filters um, and they filter the fluid that comes through them, it comes through the, the lymph nodes and then they put it through to be uh, ultimately filtered through the blood system and out through the kidneys. Now the lymphatic system doesn't have its own pump. You know, the heart is the pump for the um, your circulatory system, but the lymphatic system doesn't have a, uh, its own pump, so it relies on things like muscle movement and the contractions of those veins and arteries. Um, so it's really important to keep moving if you've got anything wrong with your lymphatic system. So what can go wrong with the lymphatic system? Well, there's quite a few things, um, but the ones we're going to be looking at are the ones around edema. Edema is um, a fancy word for swelling, um, and in this respect it means a build-up of fluid. Um, so there's causes, there's primary lymphedema, that's when you've been born with a condition, and that might mean that you have got very small lymphatic vessels, or too many lymphatic vessels, or not enough lymphatic vessels. They might be too big, they might be a bit sort of floppy and slapping around and not being very effective. Um, or they could be malformed in some other way. In that respect, that's when the body will build up the fluid in the affected area. Now, um, you can be born with it, but it often won't show up until something happens, perhaps around puberty or later in adulthood. Um, but there is such a thing as paediatric lymphedema, which is when children get it, and that can happen from birth. Secondary lymphedema is when there's some sort of damage to the lymphatic system, and that's what we tend to see the most of. With primary lymphedema, we think that's about 6% of the population. Secondary lymphedema might be um, from a surgery or an injury of some sort. What we tend to see it most of is with breast cancer treatment. Um, that's the most common sighting that we see. So if you know someone who's had breast cancer treatment and they're wearing a, a beige colour garment on their arm, they're probably working and managing their lymphedema. Um, so that secondary lymphedema comes about when there's been that damage, whether it's been a cut or a, a, an infection, or it may also be um, radiation treatment, which is why we see it a lot with breast, treatment, uh, breast cancer uh, treatment. 
Medications can also cause edema. Um, there's a whole list of them. I won't go into them today, but I'll probably cover them in a later session. Um, but there's a whole lot of medications that can create edema, and they're often associated with heart problems and things like that. Another cause of edema can be enlarged blood vessels um, or a condition known as chronic venous insufficiency. Now we know that this affects about 7% of people over 50 and about 20% of people over 70. So you'll often see these people with swollen ankles, they're purple and they look angry and uncomfortable. Um, that's usually chronic venous insufficiency. So that's when the veins aren't able to bring the fluid back out there. It's back flowing and, and pooling in the ankles. And that's a really big cause for leg ulcers. Um, but we can help manage that with the same treatment that we do for lymphedema. There's also a fat disorder, and that's called lipedema or lipedema, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And this affects women almost exclusively. Um, there are a few men that get it, but they're normally having hormonal issues at the same time. And that lipedema, um, in mo the most common cases you see it are around the, the hips and the thighs um, and the legs, and it usually leaves the feet unaffected. It can also affect the legs, uh, sorry, the arms, and more and more we're seeing people with it in other parts of their body as well. But it's a fat disorder that the type of fat cells that are laid down can't be moved with diet and exercise. It's an abnormal fat cell, um, so it's considered a disorder of the connective tissues rather than obesity. And what often happens with these people is that they are misdiagnosed as being obese and they're told that they're overweight and they need to eat less and diet more um, and go for a run and that will just help them everything that they need to do. But it's not the case. It's, um, it's, there, you can actually be anorexic and still have very large legs um, from lipedema. So that's a message we want to get out there as well, that we want to shift that thinking around fat disorders. What happens when it goes wrong? Well, fluid builds up in the part of the body that's been affected. And as I mentioned before, that fluid is quite rich in protein. Now the protein can build tissue. So that's what we call fibrosis, and that's when the skin gets thickened, and it may get hardened, and you can also get all sorts of other changes to the skin as well. It might look a bit warty, um, lumpy, hard, um, and it can be quite difficult to move that fluid out once it gets fibrotic. In the earlier stages you'll see what's called pitting and that's when it's quite full of fluid and you can press your finger on it and hold it there for 30 seconds and you'll come away and it will leave an indent in the, in the fluid. When we start moving into the fibrotic stage, which is later in the process, um, that's when you see less pitting because the fluid can't stay there anymore, it's all solid tissue. And this fibros uh, fibrosis really prevents the removal of all that stagnant fluid. It also limits the amount of oxygen and the nutrients that get to the tissues. Um, that's when we see that risk of ulcers. Um, we also see a really high risk of cellulitis with people with edema issues. And that's because the cellulitis is a really nasty infection. It can get into the blood system and it can actually be very dangerous. So we tell people that if they have even the slightest cut or insect bite, they have to be really careful about keeping that clean. And then they have to make sure that they keep an eye on it and if it gets hot or red or inflamed they need to get in to see a doctor immediately and that's not wait till Monday, uh, that's go off to the A&E and you may need antibiotics quite quickly. In severe cases they'll actually make you stay in and have IV antibiotics. Um, so that's a really significant risk. Some people have recurring cellulitis infections and they need to be on um, preventative antibiotics all the time. It's not ideal, but uh, that's the only way they can do to prevent it. And again, if we can manage the lymphedema, we have a better chance of reducing that risk of cellulitis. And one of the worst things that can happen is people beca can become immobile. They can become disabled. They can be tied to their home and they can become isolated um, and not be able to get out, not be able to move around. Um, and those are in severe cases, but that's what we are trying to prevent so I've sort of talked about lymphatic conditions. I'll talk first about lymphedema, and that's a chronic condition that's been caused by, like I said, either you were born with it, so there's dysfunction, um, or there's damage to the lymphatic system. And as we said, those tissues accumulate lots of protein-rich fluid. 
as that protein overload comes in, you can get the skin changes and fibrosis, that pain and discomfort and that um, vulnerability to infection. Also mentioned lipedema, which is a fat disorder, um, abnormal fat cells, and it's when you see a disproportionate weight gain to the legs and arms. So look, often the, the woman will have these tiny little waists and then these great big bums, um, which I know a lot of people would pay money for, but for a lipedema patient, it can actually be an extremely painful condition. It's, it's an inflammatory condition, so they tend to feel pain quite easily. Um, they often tend to be hypermobile, so their joints are quite problematic. Um, and it just does not respond to exercise and diet. Uh, there is some consideration that a ketogenic diet or an anti-inflammatory diet helps with some of the symptoms, but it's not the overall solution. Now, phlebolymphedema or phlebedema, whatever you want to call it, also known as chronic venous insufficiency, that's that one I was talking about where the leg veins um, prevent the blood from going back to the heart. So those valves are a bit floppy and you get that pooling in the tissues. That can combine into the chronic venous insufficiency with lymphedema. Um, so first of all comes the uh, chronic venous insufficiency and then as that fluid builds up it turns into an edema as well. So what do we do about it? Now these conditions are chronic, so they can't be cured, but they can be managed. And they're not actually, with the right management, you can live a really awesome life with it. Um, and we call the treatment combined decongestive therapy. Um, and it's really important that you are seen by a qualified lymphedema therapist. There's lots of massage therapists out there who do manual lymphatic drainage. They aren't necessarily qualified to deal with lymphedema though, because there's some adjustments that we need to make to that technique. So the combined decongestive therapy is made up of four components. So I've mentioned the manual lymphatic drainage, or MLD as I call it from now on, compression therapy. Um, now on a day-to-day -day basis, this is normally um, a thick medical stocking. Um, it's graduated, that means it's tighter at the bottom than it is at the top and that's to push the fluid up and out. Exercise is really important, and that's because we use that muscle pump and we help get the fluid moving. Also really important is skin care. Um, you can't let the skin dry out, you can't let any cuts or nicks get involved. Um, if you want to go out gardening, wear gauntlets on your arms so you're not getting scratched. Um, those sorts of things to prevent any injuries. Uh, don't wear tight clothing, don't wear anything that cuts and, and disturbs that flow. Tight jewellery, you want to get those loosened off or get them refitted. Um, and take real care in things like shaving. Um, we talk, people want to talk about the best way to remove hair. Best way we say is with an electric razor. Um, if you a raise a, a a, a blade can cut you, waxing causes trauma to the skin, and if it's hot wax, that's particularly bad. Um, the creams can also cause trauma to the skin, we don't know the full effect of those. Uh, epilators just torture. So yeah, look at the simplest, least traumatic um, way you can do that to the skin, and that's the electric razor. So manual lymphatic drainage is a really gentle massage technique. Um, I get people coming to me all the time and they say, oh, I thought this would be much harder. I thought this would be a lot firmer and I thought you'd be really pushing hard and poking and making it hurt. And manual lymphatic drainage should not hurt. It is, um, we're wanting to open up the initial lymphatic vessels, which are in the top layers of the skin. And that's done with a really gentle stretching motion. Um, and it's really important that we don't poke too hard because we can actually make those lymphatic vessels in the first layers of skin go into spasm and then they won't work properly. So it's the exact opposite of what you'd be trying to achieve. Now the neat thing is we open up the lymphatic vessels in the skin and that starts off this sucking motion. So if we open up on the arm, for instance, we get that open, it will start drawing fluid into it and that will sort of kickstart the whole system. We still need to pump the lymph nodes as well and there's a sequence to that. That's why it's really important that you work with a, a trained therapist. Um, and it's really quite comfortable to receive. It's quite relaxing. 
Um, there are some deeper techniques that we have to use on the on the fibrotic tissue, and that tends to be a bit more uncomfortable. But we can we've got other tools we can use on that too. Um, we won't go into all of this today. There will be more to cover over time, uh, but we've definitely got tools that we can use. So compression is I've talked about the um, the, the medical stockings. There's two stages to decongestive therapy. Um, for most people, we can just stick at the maintenance phase. They aren't advanced. There might be a stage one, in which case we just keep them at that level and it's quite comfortable. If someone's a bit more advanced, we prefer to do um, a decongestion or a reduction phase, and that will involve more intensive treatment. So it'll, I do it with um, daily manual lymphatic drainage and bandaging or wrapping. Um, and that's quite a tight bandaging system and that pushes all the fluid out. Uh, I may use it in conjunction with other tools like um, compression pumps um, and we look after the skin, we make sure that everything's going nicely and we get them exercising at the same time, so moving, whether that's just sitting at, the, at their chair and rolling their ankles or pumping their arms up and down um, or if they're getting out and walking um, or ideally swimming, we love swimming. Now that compression is really essential for preventing refilling. Uh, that is what stops that fluid from coming back. So we can empty it out with manual lymphatic drainage, but if we don't compress it and add to that tightness of the skin that the skin may be losing, um, once it gets stretched with the swelling, you'll lose a bit of the elastic recoil that the skin, skin naturally has. So that compression takes over that role and it just adds extra pressure to the skin that you'd normally have. Um, we all have it. If, if anyone's been at altitude, uh, I have a lovely photo of my mother at Machu Picchu where the air is a lot thinner and so the air pressure is a lot lighter. And her skin her eyes are all puffy because she doesn't have the same level of, of natural compression that she would have at sea level um, that would hold her skin on her face. So she's got these great big puffy eyes and it looks absolutely hilarious. Um, and that's a, the, a natural uh, example of um, how compression works. So water has the same effect as well. So being in water will have a naturally compressive effect and will work nice and comfortably and, and tighten everything up. So we uh, bandage people first and then we do that, I do that for two to three weeks and then we measure up for a fitted compression garment. Now compression garments come in a vast array of uh, choices. We've got round knits and flat knits. I prefer to put everyone into a flat knit, it's the gold standard, but it is more expensive. Um, and certainly it's um, what we need to do for more advanced cases. If someone's just at the preventative stage, um, then we can have them in a round knit. And the round knits do come in lots of options. Um, there's a company out there that does these beautiful garments which look like tattoo sleeves and fancy patterns and very nice, um, but perhaps not suitable for someone who's got a more advanced edema. Um, and that, gar that compression has to be worn every day. Um, it becomes part of the lifestyle of having lymphedema. So we make sure that's quite important and we really have to get that message across and that can be a big adjustment for people um, with lymphedema. But what we are hoping is that we can see it normalised a lot more and people will be more comfortable doing it. Um, I recently put someone into a compression garment and she was quite reluctant um, and then she rang me the next day, well it was actually a couple of hours later I got an email from her saying oh my god, I love my compression garment, it's put an absolute spring in my step, my ankle is smaller, uh, I feel so much more comfortable, thank you. So it's often a case of try it out, see how it goes, you'll probably love it in the long run. Now I talked before about the importance of movement or exercise. Um, it doesn't have to be structured exercise, it does, you don't have to go to a class. If all you can do is sit in a chair and move your ankles or move your arms, then that's perfect. Um, it's really good to work on your breathing, um, a belly breathing or diaphragmatic breathing it's also called. And there's loads of um, clips on YouTube that you can look up and do along with them. Now the reason that breathing is so important is we've got these deep 
um, lymphatic organs in our abdomen, which is a really major part of the lymphatic system. And if we're doing that lovely in and out breathing with a big fat belly, then that massages those organs, which is just fantastic. Um, and it helps everything move on. So the exercise also raises your heart rate, which is really good because that helps with those arterial pulses. So if we can get the heart rate going, then there's more blood pumping, which pushes the lymphatic system along as well, because remember, the lymphatic system doesn't have its own pump. But we're also seeing better oxygenation and deoxygenation within the blood as well. So that brings fresh nutrients and gets things moving a lot better. Now you should usually wear your garment while you're exercising. Um, I said before that water exercising is our absolute preferred medium. There's lots of exercises classes out there that you can go and join other people that might be in similar situations to you. We know that when you've got a condition like lipedema or lymphedema, a lot of women have, a, particularly women, have problems around being self-conscious and they don't want to get into a pool with other people. In these situations, there's no judgment. There's a lot of people in similar situations. Um, and water is just the most amazing place to be when you already have joint pain or you're having trouble moving because you've become weightless and it just helps you to move. Um, you can also look at other rhythmic exercises such as Nordic walking or cycling. If you want to hire an a exercycle and pop that in your living room and watch TV and cycle on that, or a cross trainer, um, those are really lovely exercises because they're rhythmic and they're getting those move muscles moving. Um, we like to make sure that people's exercise programs are simple and achievable. They don't have to be complicated. Um, like I say, if all you can do is, is twirl your ankles, that's better than not twirling your ankles at all. And we also like you to think about things like those breathing exercises and meditation is really nice as well because they all just calm everything down. And stimulating that relaxation is actually really good for your lymphatics, surprisingly, because it just helps neutralise and balance out the whole system. Talked about skin care. Now, lymphedema will stretch the skin, and that changes those elastic fibres, so the, the, it loses its recoil. Um, the acid composition will change and your bandaging and compression can also suck up some of the moisture and oils. So what we tell people to do is we tell them to moisturise before they put their garment on, get up in the morning, do some self-massage, which is a sequence we teach, moisturise, shower, shower, then moisturise, and then in, after half an hour to an hour you can put your garments on. And then take, it off at, take your garments off at night and moisturise again. You don't have to sleep with your garments on. Um, and the neat thing about this is you're going to be keeping a really good idea, a, a really close eye on what your skin's doing so you can spot any changes. So we talked about the stages of lymphedema. Um, so stage zero is your subclinical, and that's when you can't see much happening. Um, and that's when you've got the first damage might be happening, but there's nothing really much on show. Stage one is reversible. That's when it's quite soft and we get that pitting, you know, the fingerprints I was talking about, and it tends to reduce on elevation. And this is when treatment's at its most effective. Stage two and three are a bit more tough, and we can talk about those on um, later shows, but this is when it gets a bit more difficult to work with and we have a bit more of a challenge. So we like to see people before it becomes a problem. So if you've got any questions, you're welcome to contact me on our Facebook page at the Lymph Info Trust. Um, and you're welcome to um, ha put those questions to us and we're happy to answer them in future shows. You can also get in touch via that Facebook page or via our email which is lymphinfonz at gmail.com and we look forward to talking to you.